the way the work's been evolving, it's got something to do where each project looks at some force and what I'm trying to do is understand it, just something kind of viscerally, something that I relate to with my body, and then translate that in some other way. Hi, I'm Kristen Poole, the Artistic Director of the Sun Valley Center for the Arts. And I'm Courtney Gilbert, the Curator of Visual Arts at the Center. This project, this exhibition and uh, long-term project are part of a long tradition that the Center has of doing exhibitions on the landscape of Southern Idaho. This particular project is the largest and the most ambitious that we've done to date. It includes not only an exhibition at the Center, but two large-scale public art projects that will be installed at Craters of the Moon for the next three or four months through the end of September. And they will then move into the city of Ketchum where they'll be installed on a more long-term basis for the Ketchum and Sun Valley population to enjoy. As we looked for artists who we thought would be interested in responding to this particular landscape and its unique beauty, it was really important to us to work um, with artists who would respond to different aspects of the park and respond to it using different materials. And the artists that we decided to invite to uh, work on the project with us were a sculptor based in Seattle named John Grady and another sculptor based in upstate New York named Jason Middlebrook. In uh, 2016 we're celebrating 100 years of the National Park Service. You know, visitors who come to Craters of the Moon, are, they really don't know what to expect. It's kind of a blank slate. So I think most of the time they're pretty surprised at what they find here because a lot of people haven't even heard of Craters of the Moon before. I think this will just be another surprise for people when they see that art out there. It, it'll add kind of a new element to their experience. My very first experience of Craters of the Moon, which was several years ago, was um, finding the place completely unexpectedly, uh, being drawn to this beautiful black landscape, um, this volcanic black landscape, but finding these gorgeous blooms of wildflowers. It was this kind of miracle of color against all this black. The negative space was surreal. It was almost like a black desert with snow on top of it. It's high desert meets lava, meets, um, you know, this kind of harsh, harsh landscape. Moving just uh, northwest from Craters of the Moon um, to Sun Valley, which is where the sculpture is going to be placed, uh, sited after it's temporarily sited at Craters of the Moon, um, there's this history of a spur of a railroad that gave rise to the, the town, of a series of three towns that are there. So this does quietly reference that. I really got into the rock formations and really started to study the trees. And these trees are, they're so inspiring. And whatever can grow up through the lava has survived. And some of these trees they claim are over 3,000 years old. And a lot of them are dead, but they're in these different states of decay. So there could be some that have been dead for 500 years, but they're still standing. To explore the geology of the monument, and specifically these lava tube caves, which are really ubiquitous, there are thousands and thousands of them, um, and look at what's interesting about being inside that lava tube cave, both experientially and also the form of it, I realized that yes, I was inspired by these subterranean forms underground, but that it was also about a kind of a journey. It was about how you move into that landscape, it's how you move through that landscape, how you're moving through the lava tube itself, and then just kind of pulling back even more broadly, it's about the context of this, this monument, which is enormous, you know, it's the size of Rhode Island. So beginning with a, a scan, a laser scan of the interior of that lava tube cave that we chose, we had very, very specific information about that cave. And it was such that we could then, on the computer, move around in space and take the, the negative space of that volume 
and rotate it around in any kind of orientation. And then realizing that what I wanted to do was to actually stretch the form, turn it 90 degrees, reduce it in scale, um, and make it something that people could walk through with a sense of kind of greater or less compression. The other thing that's really interesting when you think about, okay, we're making this we're taking this, this form of this cave because now we understand the entirety of that form. And the idea is then to take and imagine we're wrapping a large slab of wood all the way around this form and around this form and it's tightening and tightening as we get into the cave and then loosening up on the other end. So we have that interior surface of the wood and then the exterior surface of the wood. So you have these, these pairs of horizontal structural supports which are referencing the rails. Um, quite literally, but I think a little bit more meaningfully and um, a little bit more abstractly, it has to do um, with the way in which these ribs are organized so that they're quite spread out at the two ends of the sculpture, but as you move into the center of the sculpture, you have this kind of sense of compression. I really wanted to draw the trees. It was the only way for me to capture the kind of flow and the nuances of the, of the trees, of the dead limber pines. And um, I spent two or three days going to the park drawing. The sculpture that I ended up making is maybe a combination of a couple different trees, but there was one tree in particular that I hiked up on the side of this mountain that I was really drawn to. So we start with, we bend the steel first. That's, that's the kind of fun part. We have to capture the shape of the tree. And the hard, the hard and fun part of that is that the steel is a three inch pipe. It gets run through this machine that acts like, imagine you're bending a piece of pasta. And then we weld two inch pieces, one inch pieces to make up the branches. Once that's complete, styrofoam is then added to the steel to give branch and the trunk, branches and the trunk volume. Then after that, the next stage is that the entire form is covered in fiberglass. Then it's delivered to the studio and then we start to tile it. So it's like a four part process to capture these 3,000 year old limber pines. So we were very careful about the sites that we picked. We wanted to make sure that there was no lasting impact on the landscape. The two sites that we picked were bare cinders. The place that we selected is kind of a natural picnic area with the backdrop of this enormous rock. I really like that we do have this six month period where the piece is sited right where it was inspired. They had to have parking and people will be able to access the tree that are visiting the park through the whole summer. They'll be able to touch the tree, walk around it, and it'll be in a kind of secluded area that, that is protected by this large rock. That'll be the background of the, the backdrop of this tree. What happens with the interior surface as we burn this surface and create this charred black on the inside, I think what that does when this is sited at craters is it kind of brings this volcanic landscape up and into that interior surface alone, which is most literally and specifically referencing that. They really help to bring the national parks to an audience that had never actually seen these places before. In some ways, I kind of like it that some people are going to miss it because of its nature, of its kind of gray, monochromatic, dead tree nature. But I also want people to experience it and say, oh, that's kind of an homage. That's like a depiction of these limber pines. It only stays in the park for a short period of time. Then it's moved an hour away to Ketchum, Idaho. And it's gonna be put in a public park permanently. And so the tree will be there kind of like a tombstone in a way for the, the pines that are an hour south of Ketchum. So when I think of people experiencing the sculpture, I think of two very different 
groups of people and one would be um, the person that happens across this once and that's their entire experience and I hope that that's meaningful but I think for the people who um, live nearby, who come back for repeated visits and experience the sculpture over time, over many years. I hope that that's a much more meaningful experience and I hope that what might happen is that somebody can experience this and then when they return to it there's some small aspect, I don't even know how conscious you might be of it, that informs the way in which you're looking at the bigger landscape and that maybe that becomes something that registers for you after several visits so that in some small way this does impact how you're kind of registering and framing your experience of the landscape, especially the difference between the landscape at Craters of the Moon and the landscape as you move up into the valley at Sun Valley. A project of this scale, of course, involves so many different kinds of people who can help us, and um, in addition to the artist to whom we're really, really grateful, um, we want to thank all of the public partners who have been extraordinary in sort of joining us in, in taking this risk. And I describe it as holding hands and jumping off a cliff together. City of Ketchum and Mayor Nina Jonas and her city council have been fantastic. Um, our friends at the Blaine County Rec District have been extraordinarily gracious and open-minded. And then, of course, the National Park Service um, has been really, really incredible in allowing us to uh, interpret their landscape in a different way. I really want to acknowledge the role of the rangers at Craters of the Moon in making this project happen. Without a phone call six years ago from Ted Stout suggesting that we might want to collaborate during the year of the National Park Service Centennial, this project would never have happened. And it's been a huge joy to work with them on it. Huge thanks also to everybody who's contributed to this project. We um, are incredibly grateful to our donors. Thank you.